Y'all already know what it is, Jay Williams, Let's Live Life, and we're back. The life of a lifer. Toe tag lifers. What's a toe tag lifer? We're going to get into that today. You know, I do this and I've done this since day one with one objective. That is to keep people from becoming incarcerated. Try to keep people from dying. Keep people from losing this beautiful gift that you have called life. Today, we're going to get into that. Today, we're going to get into some more stories of what it is to be a lifer and what these men are locked up for. I'm going to try to paint a picture through their stories and their words in hopes that everybody watching pays attention and doesn't end up on that side of the fence. Y'all know I done seen it. You know I done lived it. So let's relive it. I watched this documentary last night, right? And I'm big into documentaries. I watch movies. I, you know, I like a good flick. But I like the documentaries. It gives you a glimpse into somebody else's life. Somebody else's world. Somebody else's story. And I believe the documentary is either on HBO Max or Amazon Prime. But it was called Toe Tag Lifers. Life on, I believe it was Yard A. And it takes place out in Cali. And they're actually interviewing dudes. They're doing life sentences. And these guys tell a little bit about the story. And what it's like to be locked up and doing life. And in watching this documentary, I guess the whole Toe Tag Lifer, just the phrase in itself, really stuck out to me. A lot of people, they're against, you know, the death penalty or this or that. But they don't have a problem with somebody, be give, you know, being given life in prison. When in reality, a life sentence with no parole is a death sentence. Because your life is over. You don't have a life no more. Any life you once knew is gone. The only difference is they're going to house you, let you die of old age, Cancer, murder, whatever gets you first. And the state is going to pay roughly $65,000 a year to keep you alive. I've met a lot of guys that weren't okay with that. That have told me personally they would have rather been given the death penalty than 30 years later still be sitting inside a prison cell. That is the definition of the death penalty. Once your life is gone, it's gone. That's how I wanted to start today's video off. Let that resonate for a minute, let you think of that before we get into these stories. When they give you life and you're never coming home, you were just sentenced to death. You were just told you will remain here until the day you die. One of the coolest sellings I ever had by far, man. Definitely top five was a guy by the name of Big Bill that I was locked up with in CFCF out in Philly. Big Bill's a big Italian dude, and I don't remember his real name. This is a long time ago. Maybe 20 years ago. Big Bill gave me the game when I came in. I could tell just by the way that Big Bill moved and the way that other dudes responded to him and treated him that this guy had a lot of time to do big pill unfortunately was a guy that introduced me to smoking cigarettes i'd never smoked a cigarette in my life and i got to fighting one night and i come back in the cell and i'm all you know still hyped up pissed off about the fight bill's like here smoke a cigarette calm down i'm like man i don't smoke cigarettes that's just disgusting he's like just here try and calm down up until that point i hated the smell of cigarettes i still do but it is what it is. Me and Bill get to chopping it up one night. I didn't know how much time Bill had. Nobody had told me. Bill didn't really talk about his case. But I had a robbery charge out in Philly at the time. And I was stressed out over court, going to court, what they were going to sentence me to, how long I was going to be gone. I was young. I was just a teenager. Me and Bill get to talking one night. And Bill tells me, he says, look, 
no matter what happens, you're going to be okay. Because they can't give you life for robbery. You might do some years. You might plead out and do less. But regardless, you've been blessed. And you get to go back home. When you get back home, stay back home. I don't want to see you again. All right, whatever. Me and Bill will build over time. And Bill gets into why he's locked up. And he got irritated. I can't remember why he got irritated, but he got irritated about something one night. And he was like, these dudes run around like life is a joke. He's like, you don't know what I would give to go back to that night and turn back them three minutes of chaos, and get my life back. That was when it started to dawn on me when a man says, get my life back. Bill said, I will never go home. I will stay in here until the day I die. He goes on to tell me where he lived out in Philly. He said, I'm not going to say I was the man, but I'm going to say I was right there with the man. I was something a force to be reckoned with when it comes to selling drugs in the streets. I was a force to be reckoned with when it comes to fist fighting. And if dudes wanted to play with the pistols or do any of that, they knew that was a game I was cool with. He said, well, in being the man or close to being the man, you're going to create enemies. And that's what happened with Big Bill. He said dudes laid on him, watching him, and they followed him one night. He said he went out shopping, was loading stuff into the trunk of his car. He said two dudes ran up on him as he's putting stuff in his car. He said, I got a gun, but my gun is inside the car and I can't get to it. He said, but I'm leaned over in the car. And he said, dudes, tell him, you know what time it is, man. Come up off of it. Where's that? Where's that? He said he guesses, you know, talking about his money or the dope or whatever, you know what I mean? Whatever he was slinging. He told dudes, man, I ain't got nothing. He said in the meantime, as he's stalling, he's looking because the dude's got a gun to him. He said they're both, he said what they made a mistake is they weren't, you know, standing far enough away to him, that away from him, that he couldn't get to him. He said the dude was like right up on him and his homeboy was behind him. He said he kind of like looked back at him and the one dude had a gun and the other dude was just standing there, you know, ride with his homeboy and he said he's looking in his trunk at the stuff he just loaded he said a couple weeks earlier he got a flat tire the flat tire that he took off his car was in the trunk the spare was on the car the jack the, the jack stand you know the tire irons laying there and he said dude is steadily running his mouth making threats he said he, he still leaned over the trunk he said he grabs the tire and spins boom hits dude in the side of the head with it he said he hit so dude so hard with the tire and then what he did it caved in the side of his head, and the boy dropped. He's that boy when he fell, dropped his pistol. Dude's homeboy ran off. Big Bill got the gun off the dead dude laying on the ground and shot the other dude down, right? This is in the middle of a parking lot with a whole bunch of people. Right after sunset, so people see it. They take down Bill's license plate. People have done called the cops by now. Bill's headed back through Philly, headed back to his house, and he gets pulled over. He had a gun in the car, he had drugs in the car, so he wasn't in a position to where he could call the cops and say, hey, two dudes tried to rob me and I just killed them. He just got up out of there. They pull him. Now he's got the dude that he killed's gun in the car. He's got his gun in the car. Left the tire iron laying at the scene. He's got a whole bunch of drugs in the car. Bill goes on to get convicted on the two gun charges, two second degree murder charges. And sentenced to life with no possibility of parole. Bill tried to plead his case in court and say, hey, these dudes were robbing me. They didn't have masks on or nothing. But due to the fact that he had a firearm and drugs in the car, and people only a lot of times can start telling the story from the moment that the chaos pops off. He said, as I'm standing there and this dude's robbing me or trying to rob me, ain't nobody paying attention to what we got going on over there. He said, we're just... I'm caught up in a moment. These dudes are doing what they're doing. Other people are just going on by and not paying no attention, right? He said, but at the moment I hit dude with a tire iron, picked his gun up and shot the dude running, that's when everybody looks over. So all they see is a man on the ground and me shooting at the other boy, right? <coughs> so with him having drugs in the car, him having a gun in the car, and now this other man's gun, it made it seem like they met up for him to sell drugs. Bill said, I didn't leave my house that night with any intent on doing anything to anybody. 
But because of the life I led and the things I did in the street, I couldn't fight my case when we went to court. It's hard to say I'm out just grocery shopping or I'm out just picking this up or picking that up when I've got a whole bunch of drugs in the car and I've got a gun on me in the car. He said, they pulled me, they surrounded me. They didn't want to hear anything I had to say. I told them, look, man, dudes tried to rob me, so I gave them what they were looking for. Why didn't you call the police? When they searched the vehicle, he's like, that's why I didn't call the police, because I had a gun and I had drugs. Prosecutor painted it out to be a drug deal gone bad in which Bill ended up having to kill these two dudes, which couldn't have been any further from the truth. Bill was going to tell me he left behind two kids, two baby mamas, the second one he had married, that he would never go home again. Like, and this was his first trip to prison. He said, I've been in and out of jail. Never no long stays. Two, three months, six months. And he said the longest he ever done was six months. He's like, and here I am going back and forth to trial for two murders. Now, what I took from everything that Big Bill told me was, A, if Big Bill wouldn't have been leading that type of life, he wouldn't have been followed that night. He wouldn't have, dudes wouldn't have been trying to rob him had he had not been known as somebody that kept large amounts of money and kept drugs. Was Bill responsible for what them dudes tried to do? Absolutely not. That was their choice. But did he put a target on his back by the things he did in the streets? 100%. See, you may think that you can sell drugs and you can run around doing this and that and that's just the end of it but if you get backed into a corner and you feel like it's your life or theirs and you end up taking theirs just on the strength of you being a drug dealer they're not going to want to hear anything you got to say on the strength of you being a criminal they're not going to want to hear anything you got to say had Bill been just a guy that worked at a company somewhere or at a warehouse somewhere and this happened, he killed both these men. He would have been able to call the cops and say, hey, two guys tried to rob me. I defended myself and they're both laid out over here. He may have got locked up, but chances are when he went to trial, he'd have been thrown out of self-defense. Just like that, a man that's got a family at home that thinks he's going to the store Ends up going to the penitentiary and never leaving again. Now, all that could have been avoided had he had just lived his best life. But everybody's not going to do that. Anybody that rocks with Big Bill, big ass Italian dude. Dark black hair. I don't know what his hair might be gray by now. But anybody from Philly that knows Big Bill knows the situation with him kill killing the two dudes that, that tried to rob him. If y'all can get in touch with him, y'all tell him Jay said what's up. And I said, hold your head, hold it high. Now with what I do with YouTube and us reliving the things I've witnessed, the things I've been told, the things I've gone through, I always try to do something different than what everybody else is doing. Somebody's, and not somebody, a lot of people have made a comment saying, what are you gonna do when you run out of stories? You can't keep this up forever and you're right. I agree. But I'm not one of those people that just lives life day to day. I think outside the box. This is much bigger than me just telling my story and telling things that I've seen. The next stage in the game, and I'll go ahead and give you all the game. They said, oh, the game is to be sold, not told, but I'm going to give you all the game. My next stage is rather than y'all hearing people's stories out of my mouth, or me reliving my stories day in and day out, I'm gonna start giving you the next man's story. I've talked to several different guys that are doing life sentences. And here in Virginia, we do what's called, you can. they had visits face to face up until coronavirus hit, but now the thing is you do video visits. So here coming up in the next few weeks, I've got some people set up that I'm gonna bring on and sit down and we're gonna do this video visit. And I'm going to let them tell you firsthand how they ended up with life. What prison for? What prison is like day in and day out for them? I can paint a picture with words, but nobody can give it to you better than a man that's currently dealing with 
that life. The man that's currently sitting there living that day in and day out. Nobody can tell you better what it is to throw your life away or the mistakes they made. No one can tell you their story better than these men themselves. I was recently contacted by a person from foe.org, Friends Over Everything, which are prison advocates. Um, and this one guy I spoke to, he's about to turn 47. He's been locked up since he was 19. He'll never come home. I'm going to have him on. I'm going to show you all the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm not just going to bring guys on that are motivational or guys that have a great story to tell. I want to bring on the ugly too. I want to bring on the crazy people. So you can get an insight and get a look at who you might end up in a cell with. So you can get a good look at what craziness is. So you can get a good look at some of the men that do deserve to be in prison that will tell you they should never be released from prison. That's the next step in the game. Podcasting. I know a lot of y'all listen to me while you drive on long trips. That's my next thing. I don't just have to talk about me. I don't just have to talk about my experiences. I'm smarter than that. There's so much more I can add when it comes to what's going on in the world today. The senseless murders, the children being shot, people shooting into crowds. Because I've actually done time with guys of all calibers and pretty much there's not many things that shock me in today's world. Because at some point or another, I've done time with somebody that's done something similar to that. That's the next stage in the game. I'm not going to sit here and tell prison stories forever. I'm not a prisoner. I have a life as well I want to share with y'all. There's life after prison. And that's what I want to give you on the next stages. I want to show you all the growth, the development, how to get there. For the people that feel stuck or dealing with addiction and don't feel like they can get over that hump, I want to show you how to get there. Everybody, why don't I get interviewed? I've built myself up to the point that if you don't know who I am by now, you either don't have a phone, know anyone incarcerated, or don't look at YouTube. I don't have to go on another channel and tell my story. Y'all know my story. Everybody says I should write a book. I will. But I'm not at the point. All the chapters aren't written yet. So I can't write it yet. That's my next step in the game. If y'all just watch through part one of the video, this is the interlude. Let's get into the next part. I've got guys I know that I knew when I was young that are doing life sentences. I've got homeboys to this day that are cool with doing seven, eight years, coming home for six months, and then going back to prison for another seven, eight years, 10 years. Got a bunch of homeboys right now that they just can't last out here in these streets. They get out and they go right back to what they were doing. They talk a good game on what they're going to do when they get out and how they're going to turn their life around. But I honestly know some guys that will never leave these streets alone. No matter how many times they go to prison, they will always do what they've been done, doing until the day that somebody kills them or until they're locked up and never released again. Now, when you hear the word lifer and you think of why somebody's in prison, for most people, the first thing you think is murder. You think they got a murder charge, something very heinous, something against other people. That's not always the case. I've done time with guys that had the same name, nickname, on several occasions. I probably know six aces. 10 New Yorks, 10 Jerseys, you know, 10 Killers. But I met an old white dude named Killer. That was what everybody called him. Don't know his name. Old ass white man named Killer of Greensville. And the, first, the reason I met Killer is on the streets, Killer had a prescription for Oxycontin. In prison, whatever was wrong with him, I don't know what he got, or I mean, how he got it, or what he was sick with that they gave him oxys but in prison he would go get his oxys three times a day he would keep one he would sell the other two my homeboy was getting them off of him and he'd get these morphine pills my homeboy was getting them off of him and he'd always see me with my homeboy my homeboy would have the money sent straight to his books 
So he'd give my homeboy the pills for a discount. And then my homeboy would, you know, turn around and resell them for almost twice what he was getting them for, right? So when we would meet up with Killer and stuff, and this dude lived in my pod. He would meet up with, you know, walk down to Killer's cell. He'd always, Killer would always see me and my homeboy talking. So he knew that, you know, I had my hands in helping sell these pills. My homeboy ends up getting jammed up on some dumb shit and gets sent to the hole. So I go down and I holler at Killer. I say, hey, you know, I rock with such and such, man. And uh, she let me get them contracts on them pills. Like, you ain't got to worry about no larceny with me. You ain't got to worry about not getting paid or getting robbed. Dudes are going to press you for them pills. And at the time, we were kind of trying to keep it hush-hush due to the fact that we didn't want dudes to try to extort him and rob him. He's an old, fat-body white man, right? He says, okay, we'll see what happens. Send me this amount of money. Send the money in advance, which is a risky thing because if he gets caught... I've just lost my money and I didn't get my full supply. But if that's what he wants, that's what I've got to do. I said, all right, I'll do that. I had the money sent to you. Three days later, he gets a receipt. When the mail comes out, the money touched his books. The money's on there. From there on, Killer starts giving me the pills, right? Well, I guess Killer took a liking to me. Not guess, he did. I'd be sitting out at the table, whatever, just bullshitting, talking to people. And when everybody got up and walked off, Killer come out and sit down and talk to me. And we chop it up, just bullshit, do what people do when they're incarcerated. There's nothing to do but talk, you know what I mean, when it, when it comes to other people. And when you talk, most times you don't talk about the future because you're, you're stuck in the moment. Usually when you talk, you talk about what's going on in that moment or you talk about the past. Because that's all you have. You don't have a future as of now. Killer goes on to tell me, and with a name like Killer, you think he's got a body, right? Killer goes on to tell me, yeah, that's my fourth go round in prison. Not shocking. I met a lot of guys that are doing life on the installment plans, meaning they do 10 years here, five years here, 10 years here, and they're out small periods. So most of their life is spent in prison with little gaps in between, right? He said, yeah, this is my, my fourth time going to prison. First time I went to prison, I was, you know, young. And that was for something completely unrelated to the next three times, right? He didn't say what the first time was for. But the next three times, the killer would go to prison. It would be behind distribution of Oxycontin. Distribution of pills that were prescribed to him from a doctor. On the third go-round, killer said he had a guy come to his house and he met this guy through another guy that bought pills from him. He said this guy was paying him more than... You know, the other people were paying him for the pills. So he strictly started dealing with this guy. He said, man, I've been dealing with this dude two, three months now. He said, now I was getting a lot of oxys. He said, now I was, you know, he buy the whole script, the whole bottle, as fast as I could get it. Then he said, I'd, I'd make up an excuse. Sometimes I might be able to re-up on the oxys twice in a month. Tell the doctor this happened or, or I lost my pills somewhere. They fell out my pocket. Or, he said, I just make up different stories, right? He said, so this guy spent a lot of money with me. He said, and then one guy, the guy, one day the guy shows up and he's got a woman with him. He said, so I don't think nothing about it. You know, she's with him. He must be good people. He said, no, just like clockwork, I sell him the oxys. He said, the guy leaves. I'm walking through my like living room, headed back to my kitchen. He said, and my front door, boom, flies open. He said, and it's police. The guy I've been dealing with and that woman, they were both cops, both undercovers, both narcs. He said they'd been on to me for a couple months. The guy I used to sell pills to had got caught with the pills, brought this guy into the picture, and that would be my third time getting caught with Oxycontin. They went on to sentence Killer to life in prison, no possibility of parole, and he was an old man. Now he made the statement that, you know, I never hurt nobody, and at the time I could go along with that. But looking back on it, as a drug dealer, someone that once peddled in those type of things, there's no truth to that statement. You may never have hurt anyone physically, but to think that what you were doing didn't hurt people is crazy. That's like saying, I sell heroin. Yeah, people overdose and die, but I didn't play no part in it. They chose to buy it. 
That's not the case. You chose to supply it. The courts got tired of Killer and sentenced him to life. I ended up having to cut Killer off, man. I didn't know Killer was what we call a closet racist. He was one of those dudes that felt some type of way about the black dudes and I guess would voice his opinion to like-minded people. But because of the circle I kept and dudes around me, he never said anything like that, you know, in my presence. And one day I'm out there sitting in the pod talking to some dudes and it's late night and the dudes are making a lot of noise. It's the weekend, guys have been drinking and stuff. And Killer comes to the door and screams on these dudes. And the stuff he's screaming out his mouth, you know, if you in words, don't quiet down, y'all gonna make me do something. Like, he's saying things that I'm looking over at him like, oh no. So now I can't sit with Killer. I can't associate myself with Killer. Because to associate myself with him, you are who you hang out with. In prison, you are the company you keep. And Killer never told me, and this is how Virginia operates, that he was locked up for third time distribution of oxys. I would have assumed Killer was a killer. That was his nickname. Nobody did nothing to him. They looked at him like, he was a crazy old white man that lost his mind. But yeah, everybody doing life ain't doing life for killing somebody. And everybody named Killer ain't a killer. I'm gonna rock for a couple more minutes before I get out of here, man. I hate to do it, but we opened up a new house. I got several houses going right now with the construction. So as much as I love y'all and I put my focus on YouTube, I also have to put my focus on the construction company making sure the investors are happy, making sure my guys are doing their job and they're happy. But in the beginning of, the, beginning of today's video, I, I touched on the toe tag lifers. Toe tag, what they put on your toe once you're dead. That's what you have when you have life with no parole. You have a toe tag that just doesn't have a date on it yet. It says to be determined pretty much. You will be there until the day you die. I had a third story for y'all, but like I said, I got to clip this short. I appreciate all y'all, you know, for being here, for listening. I appreciate y'all that do more than listen, y'all that hear me. We got a lot of exciting things coming up. A lot that's going to happen in the future. I plan on not just trying to come to, you know, the top of what I do. But I, I look forward to bringing something new to the game. I look forward to running into people and them not just saying, hey, man, you Jay from Jay Williams does their life. I look forward to running into people that say, hey, you saved me. You stopped me from doing this or stopped me from doing that. Man, I was doing this until I started watching your videos and one of your, your videos struck a nerve and now I work for a living and I do this. We all don't have to go down that road that we feel has been laid out in front of us. We all have the option to choose another path. Some of us are dumb when it comes to the seeing it. Some of us are blinded by what we have going on when it comes to seeing it. Some of us just don't care. I want to reach out to, to everybody when it comes to that. I don't want to see none of y'all dead, become inmates, toe tag lifers. Nothing like that. I want y'all to live y'all's best life. Because you know I'm damn sure going to live mine. But anyway, these jails, institutions, detention centers, they're all just crazier worlds inside of this already crazy world we live in. And as always, y'all know what I'm doing. I'm just trying to keep y'all entertained. Are you not entertained? And like always, this is Jay Williams. Let's live life. To all my real ones. And the awesome real ones watching, because y'all still watching me. Y'all know how we do, man. Salute.